Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I was told to speak on the topic of East or West. Krishna consciousness is the best. So I'll speak this broadly in four parts. What is East? What is West? What is Krishna consciousness? And what is the best? <laughs> so East and West, if we consider at one level, these are geographical divisions. Now, but when you talk about it in terms of culture, Eastern culture, Western culture, we say just in about two weeks, I am going to Australia. I am going towards the East, but that is actually the West. So, West is more of a, it's more of a culture or a concept rather than a geographical marker. <clears throat> there was a British thinker who said, East is way, East and West is West and the twain shall never meet. These are two so different that the two will just not meet. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, one of our most prominent Acharyas, the founder, Guru of Srila Prabhupada, the first book he wrote is in Bengali called Bangale Samajikta, Sociality in Bengal. And there also he talks about this idea that what is, what is the difference between the East and the West? So, East is more of a mentality, an attitude, a consciousness. And similarly, when you use the word West, it refers to something similar. Normally, when we talk about Western culture, we may talk about modernity, we may talk about technology, we may talk about uh, gadgets and fashions and particular things like that. Now, East is not just India, it is China and much of what is considered to be traditional culture. When we look at the East, the broad attitude towards life is of acceptance. Acceptance means, I just came from Vrindavan and we had taken about 25 Western new people, most people have just practice yoga or interested in yoga. It is the first trip to India. And they're not devotees, they're not many of them have not even gone to any temples in America, they just came here. So they said that actually walking on the roads in India or driving in the roads in India, it's chaos. It's anybody will come from anywhere, anybody will shoot there and people will walk. And, but he said, after some time, he realized that there is some kind of harmony within this chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Although people drive wildly, he said, if just people were driving wildly, the sheer number of accidents and disasters that should happen, they don't happen over here. He said, Although things are chaotic, but still, this is, uh, people, people are calm, people are going on in their life. They were saying that actually if we, if somebody started, if people started driving like this in the West, firstly they would get arrested, but if they would not get arrested, people will go mad. How, how can you drive like this? And overall, what I will talk about is that the West is characterized by a lot of outer organization. And the East is characterized by inner organization. Now, inner does not necessarily mean spiritual. And this is not a matter of East being superior to the West. Because that I will talk about in Krishna consciousness. Now, what do we mean by outer organization? Outer organization means, if you go into the Western countries, the ro like we have some smart cities in India, very well planned cities. The houses have numbers. And you just use Google Maps, and you don't need to ask anyone, you can just straight reach to the house. Very precise organization. Not only with respect to uh, the way houses are organized. I had gone for a morning walk in Australia and I saw the park and there's a near the park there was an advertisement for a website. And the website's name was registeryourdog.com. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
apparently they have if you register your dog the ear band of the dog the the head band or whatever you want to call it uh, that is fed with some code and if the dog gets lost just by a scanner you can find out that code and immediately you can go on the internet and whose dog it is and you can take them to that dog <laughs> so i said in india even human beings may not be registered like that <laughs> so not only are dogs registered like that in fact there was a just now in california there's a big court case going on and what was this court case this was basically there was a couple i went for a uh, i gone for uh, when i do japa sometimes i go for a walk in new york or la so when you if you go to a park in these parks actually you see more dogs than children and especially among white americans caucasians but the number of, in the families the number of dogs are far more than number of children so people have so many dogs so this this was a normally if a family separates then when the family separates they have uh, custody battles who will have the child it's 8:15 so at that time so now here in america because pe- people don't have children so people have pets who are like children so often when a couple gets separated there are custody battles about who will have the pet <laughs> and if one spouse has the pet the other spouse has to pay for the maintenance of that pet to the other <laughs> just like you have to pay for child maintenance like that so now how do you decide say if a spouse is going to get separate if to, 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 to a couple gets separated then you have to decide who the, the who will get the child that the court has to decide and so now here there was this uh, dog who was interested this who was interested to one particular uh, person the husband or the wife and he was abused and he was not taken care of properly and because he was not taken care of properly so it became the peta the people for ethical treatment of animals made a big case for big issue out of it and now the government has decided to appoint state paid attorneys who will represent the dogs so one state paid attorney will tell how how the man is best qualified to take care of the dog and the other will tell how the woman is best best qualified to take care of the dog and they will have a court case and this court case goes up to the supreme court also over there so this case went up like that now we may say this is absurd you know why do you have to put so much for court cases so many of you may know that yoga is very popular in the west almost one out of every 10 americans is a registered yoga practitioner one out of uh, every five americans has practiced yoga sometime in the other than their lives so now people we all are relational creatures we want relationships so there's a new form of yoga which is no mention in shastra but is becoming increasingly popular and that is called doga <laughs> doga is yoga with your dog <laughs> so actually if you search on google you'll see the, so many images okay you stretch your hands you train your uh, dog also to stretch the front paws you know or both of you raise your front paw you raise your hand the dog will raise your hands raise its paws and people do this yoga and not only there are people are doing yoga there are there are there are doga practitioners there are doga teachers and there are doga teacher humans and there are doga teacher dogs <laughs> so that means there is an expert doga practicing dog who will show other dogs how to practice yoga so now not do- yoga doga so is so now this is the uh, level of external organization that is there in the in the western world and yet in this external organization what is happening something essential <coughs> last <coughs> 
so in the um, so in this level of external organization that is there what has happened is something essential is missing so i was talking about how bhakti sarasvati thakur uh, wrote this bangali samajikta and he analyzed this in the west so he said that we are souls we are conscious beings and the conscious beings interact with the outer world through two primary sets of senses does anyone know which are the senses we interact two sets of senses working. yes working and knowledge acquiring knowledge so the karmendriya and the gyanendriya now just the east and and west is not a water tight division as i said something in the east might also be a part of the western culture so similarly karmendriya and gyanendriya are not a water tight division normally what do we consider the karmendriyas the five karmendriyas the hands the legs the karmendriyas yeah so we have hands legs the excretory organs and the speech voice we get things done through that and the knowledge acquiring senses eyes ears nose skin and taste and tongue taste so tongue and voice are two different things now in broadly speaking you can say these are karmendriyas these are gyanendriyas but it's not as simple i suppose you want to pick up a suitcase now you say oh, this looks like a big suitcase uh, this is a small suitcase a small i can easily pick it up so by the size we might be able to get some gyan but when we have to pick it up sometimes we pick up a suitcase and it's so heavy i may ask what do you have stones in the suitcase so there by doing the karma also we get gyan by using the hands to lift the suitcase we get the gyan of how much how heavy it is and similarly you know if say two people are very close to each other and then say they just glance at each other say a guest comes to the house and the husband just looks at the wife and the wife says okay we should make something for them they understand so so with the with the eyes the gyan in this also we may do karma so this is not like a water tight division there's a it's like say in a building there might be entry and there might be exit so in general entry will happen through one building and exit through one door and exit through another door but sometimes exit can happen through the entry door also and entry can also happen to the exit door so this is not water tight so rather than focusing on the indriyas we can focus on the kriyas what are the actions so one action is we acquire knowledge from the outer world and the other is we act on the outer world we act to make change in the outer world so he says bhakti sarasvati sa thakur that the broad western approach is to act on the outer world to change things over there and the broad eastern approach is to take in information about the outer world to understand its nature and to try to come in harmony with that so from the perspective of those who are who consider kriya as the barometer of success now okay you change this you change this you change this you change this for them somebody who is say a meditative say sitting in reflection come on get a job do something they feel such a person just wasting time but it may well be that such a person is understanding truths at this person who is go running 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 they may un- that that person may understand after a decade or two decades or four decades so the understanding the nature of things is the primary focus of the of gyan of what we do with the gyan indriyas now of course as i said these are not un- not water tight after acquiring knowledge also we may act and to act also we need knowledge so it is not that the western culture doesn't have knowledge and it is not that eastern culture doesn't have action but what is the primary stress the primary stress broadly speaking in the western culture has been on changing the external changing the external so that we can make it better and we human beings have been given some energy some initiative and to the extent we use that energy and initiative 
we produce results over there. So if generation upon generation of, of people have focused on external change, then they have made an external change. And that's why I said Western civilization is characterized by a lot of external organization. Because that has been the consistent focus. Act with the karmendriyas. Act with the karmendriyas to change things in the outer world. So, science at one level is about acquiring knowledge. When you talk about technology, it is about making change. And most of the thrust of science is on developing technology to make changes in the outer world. And with this approach, we can have tremendous amount of, uh, you could say, control on the outer world. At the same time, whenever we focus on one thing, our attention goes off other things. And what has happened is that the inner world, understanding things, accepting things, harmonizing with things, that is what has been left out, that has what been neglected. If you look at the broad western civilization, much of it has its foundation in Christianity. Of course, before Christianity was the Greco-Roman civilization and much, many of the teachings of the Greek thinkers are very similar to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. So, we could trace cross-cultural influences. So, for example, Socrates, Plato especially, what he talks about the soul is very similar to what is taught of in the Bhagavad Gita. So, but primarily Christianity had this idea of, I am moving to another point now, that uh, why, why is it that the East has, the West has focused on outer change and the East has focused more on, you could say, inner change or inner acceptance. So, that, that comes from world view. Now, our world view determines our view. Our world view determines our view. So, say right now if you are here, so now you are here to hear this class and we can understand some, some principles for living better, for becoming more spiritual, for becoming more devoted. Now, if somebody comes to this place and that person happens to be a thief, now their world view is what? Okay, where can I steal something? Where can I get some money? Where can I grab something? So the world view determines the view. So the, they, what they will see is, okay, does anyone, is anyone, is somebody wearing a earring, is somebody having a wallet which looks very big, is somebody having some very expensive phone, and where is it kept in such a way that I can sneak in and take it and go away. So our world view determines our view. And because of that, so if the world view primarily is centered on changing the externals then everything gets pursued accordingly so in christianity the idea was that time is linear whereas before that in the greek civilization similar to what is given in the vedic civilization uh, time is considered circular now what do we mean by circular time if you look at in nature everything is circular so it's 8.30 now and then it's about 8.25 now. So after 12 hours again it will be 8.25. After 12 hours again it will be 8.25. If you see everywhere in nature time is cyclic. It's not just our, our measurement of time. Yes, we could say our seconds are cyclic, our minutes are cyclic, our hours are cyclic. But how, are, how do we determine this time? It is with the movement of cosmic bodies. And they are also moving around in cycles. So time everywhere in nature that we see is cyclic. Hmm. Now, in contrast, Christianity had this idea that time is linear. And what was their idea of linear time? They had this idea that we are going to have a, a special being, a, mess, a mess, messiah, as we may call it in different languages, messiah, who is going to come. And that person is going to deliver us from all suffering and that person 
is going to bring us bring the kingdom of god on this earth that is going to be a big confrontation a big war disaster and then after that everything will be wonderful and jesus came and many people thought that he was that promised one but he came and he was crucified then religions keep adapting their their core stories to deal with to adapt to respond to reality so they had the idea that there will be a second coming of jesus and when that second coming comes that happens that's when everything will become like paradise so the idea is time is flowing linearly forward 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 towards some climactic moment and then from the 15th 16th centuries onwards when science started getting developed now initially most of the scientists were theists they accepted the existence of god not only accepted they considered it central to their their world view that when newton made uh, discovered his theory of gravity or many other things that he discovered his idea was that o oh father i think thy thoughts after thee the way you have arranged this world i am understanding this so so they they had this theistic world view but over a period of time when science started giving humanity the power to make changes in the outer world say with uh, the steam engine we could go faster than what we could normally go and now we have jets by which you can go super fast so as we started making changes more and more at one level initially they reconciled this by saying that just at the same god who has sent jesus to uplift us spiritually that same god has provided us science to uplift us materially so the idea was both of these are gifts of god but over a period of time as people started finding that oh science can make so many changes science can make so many things better and better and better and better why do we need what at all why do we need any kind of spiritual upliftment at all if we divide history into three broad phases pre modern modern and now what we have is called post modern in the western world but the defining difference between pre modern and modern times is not in so much technology was developed so much scientific uh, research went forward but its defining difference is that in the pre modern world whether it is india or whether it is the middle east or whether it is native americans or whether it is uh, the russians or whether it is europeans everybody understood that there is some world beyond this world and that world is life's ultimate goal but with the advent of technology and the advent of modernity this world became life's ultimate goal the idea was why do we need any spiritual paradise when we can create a technological paradise here itself we don't need it and anyway who has seen that religious paradise maybe it exists maybe it doesn't exist it doesn't matter we will make change here itself so what happened the idea so let me retrace these are little complex concepts but the it's leading to important con- conclusion that is very relevant See, christianity had the idea of linear time hmm? science also had the idea of linear time that we were primitive and we will become progressive so initially the idea was that same god who is lifting us up religiously through relig- through spiritually through religion is lifting us materially through science but then this was removed uh because who who knows about god's existence so then what was left was through technology we uplift ourselves materially in this world and that became the sole focus of people's lives and that's then then what happens by that yes we can and we should make changes in the outer world if something is unclean we make it clean if something is disorganized we try to organize it but at one level we cannot change things beyond a particular limit 
there is a limit to how much control we can have on the outer world. Why? Because we are finite beings. And as finite beings, our capacity to change the outer world is always finite. Technology may extend it, but still it remains finite. And when the entire humanity's focus goes on trying to change the externals, then the internal gets neglected. On the, so what has happened, that's why I said, the whole idea that we have to progress externally, that has led to a lot of organization in the outer world. But this is based on the idea of linear time. Now, if we understand that time is cyclic, that means that if we have a wheel, it goes up, it comes down. Then essentially, there is not that much change. So when we understand that time is cyclic, then the focus shifts from outer change to inner change. Yeah, okay, it's so hot now, it's terribly hot. What do I do? Okay, you know, I may try to create air conditioning, I may try to have various kinds of cooling arrangements. It's good if we can do it. But after some time the cold will change, the heat will change to cold. And after some time the cold will change to heat. So, because the changes keep happening continuously in the outer world, if our focus is only on, change, uh, on trying to control the outer world, it just goes on and on and on, it never ends. So, that is why if the focus shifts on inner change, inner change means, okay, accept. Well, the one example of inner change could be, matra sparshas tu kaunteya, shitoshna sukha dukkadaha, agam apai no anityas, Tolerate. This will keep changing, cyclic. Sometimes good, sometimes heat, sometimes cold. Sometimes happiness, sometimes distress. Now this inner change means what? Inner change essentially means increasing one's capacity to tolerate. Inner change, it can have many different meanings, but in this context, it means increasing our capacity to tolerate. Now, Tolerance is meant for a purpose. So, till now I talked about East, I talked about West. In the Eastern worldview, because time is considered cyclic, ultimately no external change will last for long. So, therefore, don't spend so much energy on external change. In the Western worldview, uh, there is nothing spiritual. So, external is all that is there. So, we have to change the external. That is the worldview. Now, now, now when we say that the time is cyclic, that can at one level lead to a sense of passivity. Okay, ultimately nothing is going to change. Uh, once I was giving a class and I spoke on this 3.27 in the Bhagavad Gita. Does anyone know what is 3.27? Yes, Prakriti Kriyamanani, Agni Karmani Sarvasha, Ankara Vimudhatma, Karta Hamiti Manyate. So, uh, I said that this verse says that one who thinks that they, uh, he or she is the doer, that person is deluded. So then I asked this question that, okay, this if we say that we think that we are doers is to be deluded by, ignor by arrogance, by ego, hearing this raises many questions. So what questions come to your mind? So one devotee who is known to be very lazy, he very enthusiastically raised his hand. He said, okay, what question raises? He says, why should I do anything? <laughs> <laughs> if I am not the doer, then why should I do anything? But then, he may say like that, but when it is prasadam time, I very eagerly go to eat food. When it is sleeping time, I eagerly go and sleep. So we can't avoid doing things. So the point I am making here is that, when Krishna also says, Mate Sangostva Akarmani, 2.47 he says, do not be attached to inaction. So if we feel okay, there is everything is just going to go on cyclically, then what is the point of doing anything? We might just become passive, lethargic. So acceptance, there is a difference between acceptance and passivity. 
and what is the difference remember i said that the idea was religion will uplift us or in the western world was idea jesus will uplift us spiritually and science will uplift us materially so in the vedic tradition uh, bhakti sanat thakur says about gyan indriyas acquire knowledge understand the nature of the world so there the purpose is on the focus is on lifting ourselves up spiritually so when we have the idea that in the outer world ultimately nothing is going to change it is said what is news news is simply old things happening to new people <laughs> <laughs> okay here this person lost the cricket, lost this uh, here this country lost the cricket match tomorrow that country lost that match here this person became the man of the match there that person became the man of the match here this disaster happened there that disaster happened so actually essentially the same events but because they happened to new people we think they are news so the, the idea is that externals uh, when we say that external then nothing new in the external world then what is the point of life the point of life is to rise upwards not externally but internally to raise one's consciousness towards the spiritual level to grow spiritually to understand who we are and to grow inwards towards spiritual realization so one aspect of inner growth is tolerance because tolerance means we are not so disturbed by external things and then we can focus on internal things but inner growth is not just about tolerance tolerance is also for a purpose and that purpose is told by krishna in the next verse 2.14 tells us to tolerate tam sitiksha swabharata 2.15 tells us the result of tolerance yam hi navyatha yante te purusham purusha rishabha samadukha sukham dhiram somrutatvaya kalpate immortality eternality transcendence so tolerance is meant for transcendence so we tolerate the material so that we can focus our energy on spiritual growth and transcend the material ultimately but if people do not understand this purpose then that tolerance simply becomes passivity the tolerance simply becomes passivity whatever is this is just the way i am meant to be this is the way i live and i can't change anything i won't change anything and passive people are are they live a very unhappy life a very pitiable life they just don't do anything to they don't do anything to change themselves once a person was very lazy he said we are so Why are you so lazy? I am not lazy. He says, I live lifelong in power saving mode. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> now, okay, power saving mode, but for what purpose? <laughs> so, if we have very less power in our phone, we will save the power. But what after that? Maybe because I want to call somebody, make some important calls. We do not just save power for the sake of saving power. We save power so that we can use it for some purpose. <laughs> so when people are people become passive and lazy, then that leads to a lot of apathy, a lot of negativity, a lot of just things staying as they are. So if you see, relatively speaking, in India, what has happened traditionally? there was a focus on inner change there was a, india was a very spiritual culture and spiritual culture doesn't mean is people would go to temples or there are many temples or it just means that people who had made who had made spirituality spiritual growth the primary purpose of their life were valued were respected and they were followed by by people in general at whatever capacity they could not everybody can announce the world not everybody can make spirituality their primary pursuit but at least it is understood this is the this is a higher goal of life and this is what is to be pursued but over the generations what happened was that this understanding 
of inner growth was lost. And once now, who was supposed to be this understanding? It largely the Brahminical society. The Brahmanas, Brahmana is not a caste. A Brahmana is primarily a disposition. A Brahmana is Brahma Jana Diti Brahmana. One who knows life's spiritual side and one who pursues that spiritual side and one who inspires others to pursue that spiritual side. So, but as the, as the priestly class started becoming more and more corrupted, then the result of that is that people lost the knowledge or the inspiration to grow internally. And it is sad that and so many so many people who are in the dress of sadhus, they unfortunately do not act at all. Uh, uh, in a becoming way, one of my friends was at the Kumbha Mela, now Kumbha Mela is also going on. So he said that there was a sadhu who was doing yajna and he was chanting Sanskrit mantras so beautifully. Uh, some, the Sanskrit is a very mellifluous language. Start hearing it, it's actually for somebody who can absorb themselves in it, it is great uh, sonic sense gratification. <laughs> sonic sense gratification. Sense gratification through the ears. Ah, so, so pleasing to hear. Hmm? So this, this particular sadhu was chanting the mantra so sweetly. And then he lit the yajna. And after the yajna was lit, he took out a bidi from his pocket. <laughs> and then he used the fire of yajna to light the bidi. <laughs> and he smoked the bidi. <laughs> so, what is happening? Okay, you can chant big mantras, but then you are seeking pleasure in something which is almost tam which is tamasic, which is of a very low level. So then, why would people be inspired to seek something higher? <clears throat> so, so what happened in India? The spiritual, those who are supposed to lead the spiritual growth, many of them, not all of them, there have there always been and there still are many saintly people. But many, majority, they got diverted. They were lost. And over generations, for thousands and thousands of India, year, for thousands and thousands of years, Indians in general uh, were used to that culture of tolerance. But the tolerance was meant to further transcendence. But those who would inspire them to a trans towards transcendence were lost. And then what happened? That tolerance became passivity. And that's why nowhere in the history of the world has it happened that 15,000 people ruled 15,000 people ruled nearly 1.5 billion people for 150 years. Nowhere in the world has happened like that. Now, we could go into many specific historical reasons how a small number of British people ruled India. But one broad factor is that Indians in general had got used. Okay, what was the situation? Accept it. So, tolerance is a strength if it is meant for a particular purpose. But if that purpose is lost, then tolerance can become a weakness. We want to tolerate so that we can focus on fun things. So broadly we could say if you want to define tolerance, to the difference between tolerance and passivity if you want to understand. Passivity means we don't do anything about anything. Tolerance means we tolerate or endure small things so that we can focus on the big thing. The small thing is, okay, in the material world, good, bad, pleasure, pain, these keep coming. Just a small thing. It will come temporarily. But the big thing is to raise our consciousness spiritually. So this is where we come to Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness means that <coughs> the Eastern idea, the East, East traditionally focused on inner change. The West focused on outer change. But Krishna consciousness is not just about inner change instead of tolerance tolerating things, not just outer change in terms of transforming things. Krishna consciousness is about elevating our consciousness. We are souls and as souls, 
as conscious beings, we always long for love. We always long for an eternal object of love. We all long to love and be loved. And the, and the Bhakti tradition reveals God to be an extremely, in fact, supremely attractive person. And this supremely attractive person is the person whom we are ultimately meant to love. We love different people, different things in this world. Through it all, ultimately our love is meant to be directed towards Krishna. And when we learn to become Krishna conscious, then we can tolerate when necessary, we can transform when necessary. Because our purpose is clear. Certain things need to be tolerated. But certain, certain things should not be tolerated. They should be transformed. So for example, if we consider Srila Prabhupada. Now Srila Prabhupada, when he was in India at that time, to some extent, after many years of passivity, after a foreign rule, when India became independent, there's a lot of hope of transformation. Oh, now politically India's future will come. India will get transformed. And yes, it's very interesting. I have traveled across the world to almost every continent. And whichever country I have gone, Indians are considered to be among the best immigrants. <coughs> best immigrants. Means any country, people from other countries, they come in, they're called immigrants. So, in, if you go to Panama or some other South American countries, they say that actually Indians are, Indians are running this country. Indians and Chinese. Because the local people over there are maybe lethargic, maybe not so educated, not so responsible. In America, Indians are the are considered the wealthiest minority along with Chinese but Indians are very they're very successful like one of my friends is American he's a cop he says that he's a traffic cop he says if I catch an Indian speeding say I'll not give them a ticket unless it's they have had many tickets in the past because he says Indians they will not engage in crime so much so in general Indians have got a sterling reputation wherever they go India doesn't have a sterling reputation. <laughs> <laughs> India is considered a land as terribly unclean, terribly disorderly, violent, and so many things like that. Uh, violence against women and all these things are there. And of course, a stereotype. India is a land of snake charmers. <laughs> I was at um, I was actually at Princeton University as giving a talk. And somebody asked this question, you know, India, is it a land of snake charmers? He says, India has more software engineers than all of America, Europe, Australia, Canada combined together. <laughs> he said, you think? <laughs> and you still think, I have been in India for more than 40 years. Probably more than four times, maybe more than three, four times, I never seen snake charmers also. <laughs> so, but still, there are certain stereotypes. Anyway, my point here is that <coughs> Indians... Uh, it's not when I say Indians are accepting, that doesn't mean they're lazy. It is that Indians don't work very hard to change the system. If the good system is there, Indians will work hard and they'll excel in that system. If the system is bad, they will try to find some way to work and succeed within the system. <laughs> <laughs> they will not try to change the system. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that it's not that we are entirely passive, but the idea is okay. I will take care of myself. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of a <coughs> there's once there's, a, there's once a king, and this king, he said, his minister was telling him actually people, if you don't if you don't monitor them carefully, they will always become dishonest. It is said that morality is simply lack of opportunity. <laughs> People are moral as long as they don't have the opportunity to be immoral and to get away with that immorality. Once a young person was, a young man was driving a car and he was driving way above the speed limit. So a cop caught him and pulled him over. He says, didn't you see the speed limit? 
said, I saw, I saw the speed limit. I just didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, some people think that actually breaking the law is not the problem. Getting caught after breaking the law is the problem. <laughs> So similarly, so this, this minister was telling that people, if they give them a chance, they'll be dishonest. So he said that, so let's test it. He said, he had a big tank and he said, all citizens are requested to bring one pail, one small container of milk and pour into that tank. And because the king had given the order, every single citizen came there and they poured a pail. And the king was very pleased. He says, yes, yeah, see, all the citizens are so obedient. They have all come and given a pail of water, pail of milk. And then the minister said, okay, let's go and see. He said, what is there to see? He opened the, they opened the tank, they looked from the tank and they saw it is full of water. <laughs> The minister said, just see, he says, what happened? He says, do you, what happened? He says, do you mean every single one of my citizens is a cheater? He said, everybody thought, nobody put in milk and everybody put in water. He said, no, everybody thought that if everybody else is putting milk, I put in water, what is the problem? <laughs> So, <laughs> so, what happens here is that many times we, uh, <clears throat> when we don't work to change the system, we think that yes, it needs to be changed, you do it, you do it. So what happens if there is a good system, if there is good external organization, no, Indians do have the talent, the energy, the vision, the vigor to do extraordinary things. But if there is no externally good system, okay, just accept it and make sure that you find your way ahead. That's how we tend to work. So there are times when things need to be externally also transformed. And there are times when externally things need to be tolerated. So Krishna consciousness is about not just about tolerating things or about transforming things. It is about how best can we serve Krishna? How best can we grow towards Krishna? So I was talking about Srila Prabhupada and Srila Prabhupada saw that when he was in India, everybody was had caught into the, had bought into the Western dream. That oh, we will have a progressive society. We will progress materially, we will progress technologically. And people are not interested in spirituality. So Prabhupada was not passive, okay, people are not interested in spirituality, just, they are not interested in bhakti, just give up. See, there are certain instructions which are given for emphasis. They are not to be taken literally. Say for example, Bhakti Sankhya Thakur said that, if you speak about Krishna and nobody comes, then what? Speak, speak to the walls. Now, the idea is don't lose heart in, lose, don't lose heart in speaking. But that doesn't literally mean that even if nobody comes, you keep speaking to walls. <laughs> so Prabhupada, when he saw that Indians were not interested, he went to America. Now when he went to America, no, if you if you get to be with people who were hippies, hippies were like an extraordinary, you could say, a species outside the 8.4 million species. <laughs> Uh, extraordinary people actually. So they would, they would, they had just rejected everything in society. Rejected means, everything means they rejected, okay, the mainstream's idea of education, about having a family, about having a career, and everything, you know, even about maintaining basic cleanliness. So just like if you go to a fish market and you can smell fish from a long distance, so like that you can smell a hippie from a long distance. <laughs> <laughs> This is not, not to criticize them, but yes, they were like that. And for Prabhupada, for a person who, you know, who, was, who had always lived as a pure Vaishnava, he had never eaten, even eaten tea in his, drank tea in his life. And for such a person to go and live among people, 
whose only regulative principle was to break all regulative principles. <laughs> it required an extraordinary amount of tolerance. An extraordinary amount of tolerance. Yes, these people are like this. I won't judge them. I won't criticize them. I won't alienate them. But I will encourage them. So Prabhupada tolerated it. Prabhupada, but it is not just tolerating, oh, you are doing that, continue doing that. No, he tolerated so that he could give them a path to change themselves. So tolerance is for a purpose. It is for furthering transformation in a particular direction. And he transformed people in an extraordinary way. Not just one or two, but hundreds, thousands, even millions found a way to raise their consciousness upwards towards Krishna. So Krishna consciousness is essentially about growing towards Krishna. Connecting ourselves with Krishna and connecting others with Krishna. And Prabhupada, for this purpose, he tolerated and he transformed. Whatever is required, he did that. And when you talk about Krishna consciousness is the best. What do we mean by the best over here? <clears throat> we have to live in the world that we are in right now. And sometimes in bhakti, some people, some devotees can become missionaries of some causes that are related with bhakti, but they may not be centrally bhakti. Like some devotees may feel that technology is terrible. Technology is, you know, technology is, is cause pollution to the environment, it does this, it does that, it does that. And yes, some people may say, oh, internet is so terrible. Internet, you know, you can get so distracted, there is so much obscenity, so much nonsense, so much this, so much that. Some people can become crusaders against technology. But, through technology, so much good can also be done. I gave a class once on internet in the three modes. <laughs> you know, internet can also be in Sattva Guna. Now, today, if somebody wants to learn, learn some subject. Now, we have access to knowledge that in recent humanity, people, recent history, humanity never had. If somebody wants to learn something, it can be in one part of the world and from any other part of the world, you can get knowledge. So, if somebody is in Sattva or, and they are trying to be in Sattva, then so many resources to be in Sattva are there. But somebody wants to be in Tamas, there are so many resources to go into Tamas. There's a boy in Thailand, he kept browsing the internet continuously for 71 hours. Not just kept browsing, he forgot to eat, he forgot to drink also. And then he just, just had a, like a stroke and he fainted. Fortunately, the neighboring some other boy was there, he called the ambulance and he survived. So if somebody wants to get distracted, they can get, get so terribly distracted. And just as in mainstream society, if we see, we consider the number of people in Sattva are less, number of people in Rajas are more, number of people in Tamas are much more. So similarly, the same we will see on the internet. On the internet, the content in Sattva will be less, the content in Rajas will be more, content in Tamas will be much more. So it's just a reflection of modern society. So some devotees may actually be doing a huge amount of outreach through the internet. So, now Krishna consciousness is such that it's not pro-technology nor anti-technology. Now, some devotees may feel technology is very distracting, it's very bad. Okay, if that's your inspiration and you would like to have a, 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 a version of spirituality which is simple, natural, without any technology, that's perfectly fine. Krishna consciousness is so big that it can include people who are anti-technology and it can also include people who are pro-technology. So what is the best about Krishna Consciousness is that it is inclusive. Inclusive means Krishna Consciousness is the best is not, we are not saying this in a sectarian sense that we are the best path. Rather, whatever is best wherever, it all can be used in Krishna's service. So somebody wants to live without technology and be Krishna Consciousness, that's wonderful. Somebody wants to use technology and be Krishna Consciousness, that's also wonderful. That can also be done. So, what say is Krishna conscious is the best means all of us have certain desires, certain inspirations, certain capacities uh, to do certain things in life. 
So now it's not that Krishna consciousness means that oh you just give up all your inspiration, give up all your energy and just chant Hare Krishna and do nothing in life. No, it's not like that. Whatever we are doing, whatever we feel inspired to do, we do it for Krishna. I'll conclude with two incidents. One is uh, Mr. Prabhupada. When Prabhupada was in America, was in UK at that time, uh, wow. UK was, the London was the headquarters for Europe at that time and devotees from Germany, from France, from various places and UK of course, various places, they would come and they tell Prabhupada how, how the Bhakti tradition is spreading everywhere. And there's one devotee over there, <coughs> he felt that everybody is telling what they are doing for Krishna. He says, I have nothing for, I know service for Krishna. I know service for Shri Prabhupada. So, he, I met this devotee, in, he's staying in Alachua now. So, I met him also, he told me the same incident with much more animation. So, he went to Prabhupada and he asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, what can I, what can I, everybody has something to do for you, what can I do for you? So, he said, Prabhupada says, what do you want to do for Krishna? He said, no Prabhupada, whatever you tell me, I will do. Now, Prabhupada says, what do you want to do for Krishna? He says, no, no Prabhupada, whatever you tell me, I will do. Prabhupada says, understand our philosophy. He says, find out what you want to do and do it for Krishna. So, find out what you want to do and do it for Krishna. We could say Krishna consciousness at one level means our spiritual master gives instruction, do this and we do it. Now, if you get an instruction like that, it's wonderful. But as our movement grows and the spiritual master may not personally know the disciple, it's not the spiritual master has to give a personal instruction to everyone. We have to see what Krishna, what gifts Krishna has given us, what interests we have, and we do that for Krishna. So this devotee, he said, he had never thought like this. He said, let me think about Prabhupada. Then he came back after a couple of hours. He said, Prabhupada, I like to work with clay and uh, I like to make shapes and forms, do some artwork, and do some artisan's work, you know, pottery kind of. So he said, I thought that we get mrudangas from India, but they break down. Some, they break sometimes. So I will make some mrudang with some material that is available in the western world and that will be more sturdy, sturdy, it will not break. And Prabhupada said, very good, he said, your god brothers are very passionate. He says, you should make the mrudang such that even if they throw it down, it will not break. <laughs> and what happened? Prabhupada, <coughs> Prabhupada actually made uh, made uh, uh, the devotee got a lifelong service. He not only made Brudangas, he started making various other artistic things depicting uh, depicting various devotional themes with unbreakable material available in the best. So Krishna consciousness means whatever we can do the best, we do it for Krishna. So I started with dogs. So I also end with dogs now. <laughs> <coughs> so I met this um, devotee Mataji in the West. And she was telling me she grew up in a, she grew, grew up in many, she was practically like an orphan, she grew up in many foster homes. And the only constant, she was all changing maybe one year in a house, another two years in another house, another two years in another house. She says the only constant during her childhood was her dog. She had a small pet dog and whenever she would, she had told the <coughs> child protect, child services that you know, I will not go to any family unless uh, they accept me with my dog. So then, what happened, she was very attached to her dog and somehow, how Krishna works is extraordinary, that she said, that the dog gave her faith that there must be a God. How? He, she felt that, you know, okay, and there is, how is it that so many things are changing in my life, but this dog always stays with me. There was someone taking care of me. So it's amazing that a dog points someone to God. <laughs> but then, after that, she came to Krishna consciousness. She was introduced to Bhakti. And devotees told her that, you know, attachment to dogs, it is material attachment. Give it up. And she gave up, gave that up. Now, she, she had been trained. She had also trained to become like a, a person who works with dogs. Takes care of dogs and trains dogs. She gave it all up. And then she was... She, uh, she was practicing bhakti and she was chanting Hare Krishna, not remembering Krishna, I was remembering dogs. So what to do at that time? Then she talked with a very senior mature voice and he says that, you know, that if that is what is your profession, that is what is your passion, then find out how to use it in Krishna's service. 
So, you know, whatever experiences we go through, we all go through different kinds of pains and troubles in our life. Our pains are not meant to be wasted. They are meant to be harvested. So, she thought that just as I, when uh, I was a small, almost like orphan girl, and the dog with me, the dog offered me so much consolation, so much strength, so much affection. So, she has created like a dog therapy center, wherein children who are orphans or children who are traumatized, children who are coming because they are separated from their parents or whatever, they can come and they can play with all these dogs. And all this, in this dog kennel, she has put everywhere pictures of Krishna. Krishna lifting over the hill, Krishna doing this, Krishna doing that. And she has nice soothing devotional music going on over there. And what happens is the kids come and yes, just say, play with this dog, they just calm down and they enjoy playing with the dogs and she tells them stories and she's got other dog therapy dog therapists who are also tell these stories and she's bringing Krishna into the lives of children who are lost and who would never hear about Krishna. Now I'm not recommending having dogs as pets. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my point. My point is that Krishna consciousness is best because it is so inclusive that wherever we are at, we, from there we can move towards Krishna. And Krishna consciousness, is it about inner change? Is it about outer change? It is about both. It is about tolerating. It is about transcending both. But ultimately, it is not just tolerating. It is not just transforming. It is about connecting. About transcending. When we connect with Krishna, when sometimes tolerance can help us to connect with Krishna, sometimes transformation can help us to connect with Krishna. And whether we live in a technologically advanced society or a technologically primitive society, it doesn't matter. What matters is we connect with Krishna. And that connection with Krishna will bring the best in our lives, whether whatever else is happening in our life. So that is the opportunity and the blessing that Srila Prabhupada has given us by providing us the Krishna consciousness movement. Wherein, wherever in whatever situation we are in, we can practice Krishna consciousness and experience the best that life has to offer. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of East or West. Krishna consciousness is the best. I first spoke about East and West. So these are not simply geographical markers or geographical directions. They are actually broad uh, civilizational attitudes. And I talked about broadly the Eastern attitude is the attitude of tolerance and acceptance. Mm -hmm. The Western attitude is of transformation and innovation. And how uh, Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur says that in the East people focus on the, more on the activity of Jnana observing the world and understanding the world. Success is based on the Jnanendriyas, how active your Jnanendriyas are. So Karbendriyas and Jnanendriyas, they are broadly means of either we act to change the world or we act to un we understand the world. And more, these are not black and white, it's more of the what activity is we doing, as trying to change or trying to understand. In the western world, because of the linear idea of time, which came from Christianity, that there will be a second coming of Jesus when everything will change for one, for the better. So, because of that, there is a lot of hope of external change. And when science came along and started promising external change, then people thought that the same God who has given us religion or Jesus to lift us religious spiritually has given us science to lift us up materially. But then as start, science started changing more and more material things, we started thinking, why do we need to have talk about some other world where things will be better? We will make this world itself into paradise. And that's how in the outer world, there is extraordinary outer external organization in the western world. Talk about how, how in the road every single house is properly named, even dogs are registered, even there are attorneys to decide custody issues for dogs. So things are very well organized externally. But this our world view determines our view. When our vision becomes focused only on external change, then when we can't do the external change, when the externals don't change the way we want them to, we can't tolerate it, we get overwhelmed. And that causes a lot of mental problems and dysfunctionality in society. In India, in contrast, the focus has broadly been on acceptance. 
and that stems from the world view that time is cyclic that ultimately when things change for the better again they will change for the worse this is the summer winter summer winter the seasons are going to change like that so so now tolerance is a strength provided it has a purpose that is transcendence okay don't don't worry about so much about external change so that you can focus on inner change but as the uh, brahmanical culture crumbled because of inner corruption and various other factors then people who were meant to lead this inner transformation they also seem became materially attached and then all that remained was as neither external change nor internal change so uh, tolerance means we keep we keep small things small so that we can focus on big things passivity means we don't do anything about anything and that's what has happened that's how say 15000 britishers rule 1.5 billion indians for 150 years and now i talk about how indians when we say passive it doesn't just mean power, powerless or uh, irresponsible it just means that we don't try to change the system so indians are very well respected immigrants in the west in the world because if there's a good system excel and if there's a bad system is find some way to keep moving themselves and now in today's world because in, in today's india <coughs> we see the example of shri prabhupad that he knew when to tolerate when to transform based on his focus so he when he focus went to america and tolerated people who were extremely unclean because they had some spiritual spark and the focus for a devotee is on connecting so krishna con hari krishna krishna consciousness is primarily about connecting with krishna and then tolerating or ton- trans- transforming accordingly and krishna consciousness is the best in the sense that whatever we can do best we can do it for krishna i talked about how the devotees are making art is pottery and using <coughs> clay plaster of paris for making various items in the krishna consciousness prabhupada said find out what you want to do and do it for krishna and then i talked about this devotee who, who for whom a dog pointed to god and then now she is using dogs to point other children towards god so our pain is not meant to be wasted it is meant to be harvested and krishna consciousness is so inclusive that wherever we are from there whatever we can do the best we can do it for krishna and grow towards him thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna hare ram any questions or comments so to the uh, indology the study of india is currently turned from the west view so uh, no other country has that kind of situation where their country is being studied from outside and those people what they do is they publish that kind of paper papers in their research which is picked by the people who are planted in india to basically for the Uh, you know purpose of conversion activities let me give an example like aryan invasion theory it was planted long back it's completely debunked by the genetic and other archaeological evidence but still being taught in our school uh, you know that it we are still studying the debunked aryan invasion theory so my question goes from here so like should we work towards you know as an intellectual chatriya to do research over all these things that's happening and we know the fault line which is being used by these people academic academic from the west as well as from india to fight their yeah, good question view of india and you know correct that view or should we invest our own time in you know my power cord laptop is getting discharged my power cord laptop is getting discharged it just me and be helpful in my own growth in my own sadhana so which is which is the way i should go okay or anybody yeah. else right <coughs> so indology is being done from a western perspective which is biased against india so should we become intellectual kshatriyas who fight against uh, this or should we just practice our sadhana <coughs> it's not a matter of this or that it's a matter of what works best for us 
<coughs> see if, uh, again there is a tend one tendency uh, to blame or demonize others it is true that indology is quite biased but i would say that we can't just blame western people for that if you see indians in general uh, are very hard working in fields which lead to individual success by well, indians i would prefer to specific to hindus over here that but they don't work very much to get into fields which are having a lot of social influence you go into engineering you go into medicine if you see jews they are minority but they are probably among the most influential they get into law they get into journalism they get into media <coughs> they influence a large number of society the devotee whose devotee family's son who also became a devotee and he wanted to become a scholar of hinduism and he wanted to become a scholar of hinduism so he said i'll do a phd in humanities in hinduism and his mother told him if you don't do engineering i will commit suicide and then eventually so we ourselves have also we have left that field open so um, it's not just that they are bad it's just that we have also been neglectful so the nature of the world is that uh it's it's competitive who if person a doesn't speak person b will speak so uh, now having said that if we feel inspired to make a change certainly we can do it the challenge in this is twofold first is that if somebody is intellectually equipped to do certain things then doing that gives them satisfaction doing that gives them a sense of okay i'm doing something valuable in my life and that is very good but <clears throat> sometimes if we are if we get so caught in a particular thing that we think this is everything and spiritual doesn't matter so we can do our sadhana and we can do this also as a service but the tendency of the mind is if one thing is important it makes it all important and sadhana what does this do you know we may change the, change the intellectual perception of of the vedic literature but we may not experience spiritual transformation by that so we need to make sure that we so krishna consciousness is the best means if you have a intellectual tendency use it and bring a transformation but don't let the intellectual tendency dominate our spiritual pursuit on the other hand if somebody does not have that intellectual capacity but just reads all these things and gets agitated by that then that is simply simply a distraction because it's, it's not just you could say indology there are so many things wrong in the world you could say that even in india there is so much poverty there is so much corruption there is so much environmental degradation that's happening there are so many things wrong in the world now if we just start looking at all that is wrong and keep hearing that we will become so discouraged we just feel helpless we feel powerless so prabhupad says in the seventh canto purport that we should always stay healthy and stout in mind and intelligence to distinguish the purpose of life from a life full of problems it's a very profound statement distinguish the purpose of life from a life full of problems this is a problem this is a problem this is a problem this is a problem but which problem should i try to solve and if i try to solve all of them i will not solve any of them and if i keep hearing about all the problems that can also demoralize me so therefore if we just keep hearing oh these people are so bad 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 and it's terrible 
it's uh, we'll just feel disheartened, we'll feel negative, we'll become irritable, we'll become resentful, and that will not be of much help. So, uh, if we feel driven to make a change, then make a plan and do something tangible to do it. But don't get so carried away that we neglect our sadhana. And if we can't do anything about it in our particular situation, then better don't hear about it. It's not that we are running away from the problem, but rather it's that we are choosing our battles. Okay, which is the battle that I can fight and win right now in my present situation? Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yeah more or less uh, an additional question to this is, like I mean, uh, we Indians have a tendency to think that everything is very peaceful if you talk to someone, but generally that's just are grown up with a uh, with a realization that the world is full of conflict, so they always prepare for the conflict. So we should also be like in that mood, or should we be you know in a very relaxed mode and doing sadhana in one corner and uh, chanting or sixteen rounds? So I mean, which, which mode is better? Like to, to to think that world is full of conflict and every century is you know conflict. So okay, be yeah. prepared for all the conflict possible. That's true. So I mean, my so I got your question. Uh, should the, we? Uh, should so uh, that's also a conflict, right? So uh, mm. ultimately, uh, after Good I thought everything is very peaceful, why should I fight? Then maybe Lord Krishna says, no, this world is full of conflict. You have to uh, be chakriya and take your arms in the okay, end, right? Yeah. So, okay. so Good question. my question. So should we be always prepared for conflicts, like say people in the West star, or should we just uh, <coughs> just talk and think that everything is peaceful and do our sadhana? Didn't Krishna also tell Arjuna that you have to be a Kshatriya and fight? <coughs> yeah, that's why I said we are not talking about not fighting, we are talking about choosing our battles. See, Krishna's point in the Bhagavad Gita was not that everybody should fight wars, physical wars. Krishna's point was, Arjuna, you are a Kshatriya and if you try to act like a Brahmana and not fight, that is not going to work. But Krishna, when he spoke the Bhagavad Gita, actually, uh, I gave a class in Yale University, and there's a Hinduism professor. He said, You know, how can you, in today's world of religious violence, with terrorism, how can you uh, speak on a book that was spoken to make up somebody fight a war? <laughs> I said, the Bhagavad Gita was not spoken to make Arjuna fight a war. You can see this. From the end, what does Arjuna say? Karishe vachanam tava. He is not saying I will fight a war. He says I will do your will. In that particular situation, doing divine will means meant fighting a war. But you see, throughout our history, there are so many Acharyas. Now, okay, whatever Indology might be doing, Indological scholarship might be doing to India, I think that much bad or far worse things were done when, say, uh, Islamic invasion was happening in India. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur wrote his Bhagavad Gita commentary when he was just actually restoring Vrindavan from the debris, the devastation that had happened because of Islamic rulers. And yet, neither in his Bhagavad Gita commentary nor his Bhagavatam commentary does he anywhere talk about how terrible Islam is and how we need to form an army and fight against it. No. He just is relishing the Gita and he is inspiring others to relish the Gita. That doesn't mean that if somebody there was a Kshatriya who was ready to fight, he would have discouraged him. But the point is that <clears throat> at that time books were primarily written by Brahmanas for Brahmanas. Before the printing press came about, books were not for mass circulation. Most people learned most of what they learned from the oral tradition, not from books. So therefore, the, in his books, he doesn't get into that. So, he just learn how to relish Krishna Bhakti. How to, uh, so, the point is that Kshatriya should fight. A Brahmana should not get into fighting. Now, Brahmana also fights. Brahmana fights by giving spiritual knowledge, by fighting against ignorance. So, when we are chanting Hare Krishna, what are we doing? We are also, we acknowledge this world is a place of conflict and we are fighting against the lust, anger, greed, envy, all of that in our own hearts. The <clears throat> in the UNESCO charter, it is said that just as war begins in the minds of people, peace also has to begin in the minds of people. So what we are doing is 
we are trying to purify ourselves so that the forces that cause war lust anger greed they get curbed and of course we understand that just inner transformation is not enough in a real world with real dangers outer preparedness is also required so we have to see what our role is it's not that brahmanas are expected to take up weapons and it's not that kshatriyas are expected to simply study shastra everybody has their particular role in society and we rather than criticizing others for not do, doing a particular role maybe this is not that particular role this is my role and you will see that the devotee community will also reflect the broader human community broader if you see in the broader human community how many people are really activists yes some people are activists not a many if you took a broad cross section of indian society or any religious society for that matter a few people will be passionate for a particular cause not everyone it's not that other people are bad people but they are doing different things so yes if we feel very strongly about a particular cause then we can pursue that <coughs> but don't criticize those who are not doing it don't think that you know this is important this is not important what you are doing is completely unimportant no but krishna consciousness is so inclusive that there can be many different definitions of success in krishna consciousness and say countering intellectual misconceptions about the broad dharmic traditions that is also a definition of success and we can pursue that also but while doing that don't criticize others who are doing other things they are also pursuing the same cause in a different way they are also we are all fighting the same war against ignorance now we are in a particular regiment they are in another regiment our war might be something which is very dear to our hearts but that may not be so dear to others hearts so one understanding of tolerance would be that in this context is that we should learn to live with different definitions of success for different devotees and we pursue our definition of success and ideally it is good if we have the association of other devotees who also share that definition of success so that we can move forward together and if we have one senior devotee who appreciate that definition of success even if they are not actively pursuing that then they will make sure that we don't overdo things that we can do things in a krishna conscious way okay thank you do we have time for questions <coughs> probably one question is there which i okay uh, from the devotees who are watching the lecture mm-hmm. online uh, so one mother is asking tolerance is sometimes taken as weakness of person uh, then how to deal with such situations and persons mm. is <coughs> okay if if tolerance is seen as weakness by others then how do we deal with that situation of people it's not so much how others see us it's more that how we are affected by ourselves by that it doesn't matter so much how other people see us you know the important thing is if we have a clear purpose in our life and if we are pursuing that purpose then even if somebody thinks us weak that's okay the important thing is that we keep pursuing our purpose but if say some how somebody sees us is going to interfere with how we pursue our purpose then <coughs> then we may have to be assertive i'll give an example to illustrate this that prabhupad when he was in america and he was giving classes to these people who were hippies and at that time they had no no etiquette in fact i was at a college program in america and there was another senior devoted in a college program he was telling me that when he was doing college program there were like two people who were coming for the program one boy and one girl and they said that they will come only on one condition the condition was that during the class the girl will sit on the lap of the boy <laughs> <laughs> so now <laughs> they no idea of culture <laughs> is it <laughs> So when Prabhupada went to America, it was not just that; it was people were high on drugs. One time, Prabhupada was giving a class, and suddenly one happy God, one person got up and said, "Mama Ji, I am God." <laughs> Prabhupada, please accept my obeisances and sit down. <laughs> please accept my obeisances and sit down, Prabhupada. 
So you know, Prabhupada is going to have gone into a you are not God, but this person is higher in drugs. You know, what can you tell? How can you tell you are not God? So Prabhupada chose what way works best. So we have to, if our purpose is to do a particular thing, then we just focus on that purpose. And if people's perceptions affect us in pursuing that purpose, then okay, we try to deal with that perception. But we should not, we should, we can't be completely unmindful of people's perceptions. But at the same time, we can't have our mind full of people's perceptions only. That means, okay, this person is thinking like this about me, this person is thinking like this about me. No, we have to see what is my purpose and how best can I serve my purpose. So, over a period of time, when, when we keep moving forward purposefully, then people will appreciate, you know, okay, I thought this person was weak, this person has actually done this, 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 this. That way, rather than <coughs> trying to just act to prove to others that I am strong, you know, we act to pursue our purpose, and then our actions will, those that purposeful action will eventually show people that we are strong. Okay. Thank you. So we are very grateful for seeing that actually how this one and a half hour passed, we did not even realize because somebody is so perfect in this presentation and so deep, so logical and so much loyal to Shri Prabhupada's teachings and words of our Ashtar.